I have two stories to share with you. The first one goes back to Sfas about 500 years ago when the Ariza was there. There was in Sfas a baker. Simple person, dedicated, committed, and he had a custom which he kept a secret. Friday afternoon, early in the afternoon, he would come into the shul, the synagogue, with two giant chalas, and he would put them down on the bima, and he would say, Ibn Shalom, Creator, I bake these in your honor, and I want them to be for you instead of the lechem upon him, the showbread that there was in the temple in Jerusalem. We don't have the temple in Jerusalem. I'm offering these to you in place of those breads. We leave it on the, on the bima and go out. Later on in the afternoon, poor people would come and take it. Now, if your logic button is working, if really he didn't tell anybody about it, how do we know that he did it? That's like the Mark Twain's story about the guy who had uh, phenomenal adventures in his dream, and at the end of the dream, the adventure caused him such fright that he died in the dream. And you're supposed to figure out if that really happened, we would never know about it. People just enjoy the story. They don't bother figuring it out. The logic doesn't bother them. How do we know? Well, we know because one afternoon, one Friday afternoon, uncharacteristically, a rabbi was in the shul early in the afternoon when the baker came in. But the rabbi was sitting at the back of the shul, <coughs> and the baker was used to the shul being empty, didn't look around, and he came up, and he put his chalas on the bima and made his usual declaration. This is be favorable to God as the showbread of Jerusalem. He put them down and started to walk out, and the Rav came out of the shadows and said to him, what are you doing? What are you doing? Your bread should be a replacement for the showbread in the temple? Don't you know that it had to be in the temple? Don't you know that there had to be 12, not 2? Don't you know that it had to be prepared with ritual purity, which you don't have and we don't have? What are you talking about? Where's your brain? And he embarrassed him terribly. So the baker went home emotionally destroyed. The Rav left the shul and went home. Shortly before Shabbos, a messenger came to him from the Arizal. And the message was, you'd better have a good Shabbos this Shabbos because most of Shabbos you're going to die. You need to know that those chalos of the baker were as pleasing to the creator as the showbreds in Jerusalem. And you destroyed it. You destroyed it. And Moses Shabbos, the rough died. What do you, what do you hear here? What, what, what dynamics come out of this story? What, uh, what lessons would come out of a story like this? That's the first lesson. You never know how much a mitzvah is worth to Hashem. We spoke about this a couple of times in the past few days, but we talked about the difference between evaluating an action and evaluating an agent. The Rav was surely correct in what he said about the action. It's two and not twelve. They're not pure. It's not Jerusalem. It's not in the temple. All of that information is correct. But he drew the uh, conclusion and portrayed it to the baker that what he was doing was foolish, stupid, worthless. He had no right to do that because a Kodesh Baruch Hu looks at the agent in addition to the action. Yeah, not that a Kodesh Baruch Hu ignores the action. No, both are important. 
Now, what in the agent would you think qualifies what he did as being precious to the Kodesh Baruch Hu? That's very interesting. Okay, that's a very interesting thought. In other words, you're assuming he didn't know what happened to the chalice later, yeah. and and he, that wasn't of interest to him. And in fact, it was charity. So you're suggesting that charity given unintentionally is a very high form of charity. Yeah, an, an anonymous way. Sorry, what? An, an anonymous way. Okay, now let's now now we I think we're shifting grounds. Now let's try to let's try to get clear. There's a difference between I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a case that's actually brought. That's a chazal. Rashi brings it to Chumash. Let's suppose somebody has money in his pocket, and he has a hole in his pocket, and the money falls out, and the person is unaware of it, and actually a poor person picks up that money, and benefits from it. What's the status of that? So if you read Rashi, if you read Rashi carefully, he says, again, quoting Hazal, that the person who lost the money will get a blessing from the fact that a poor person had use of the money. But now, when you read our texts, every word is counted and every word is, pre is, pre is placed precisely. Rashi doesn't say that he fulfilled the mitzvah of charity doesn't say that. He doesn't say he'll reward for the mitzvah of charity. He doesn't say that. What he says is there'll be a blessing that attaches to him because a poor person actually found the money. You can do things that generate blessing without having fulfilled the mitzvah. And it makes a difference because a person has a mitzvah of giving a certain amount of his money to charity. Should the money that fell out of his pocket count or not? Even if later he finds out that a poor person uh, actually acquired it, we have a rule that mitzvah srichos kavana. In order to do a mitzvah, you have to have an intention of doing the mitzvah in what you do. Without that intention, the mitzvah doesn't count. And let me elaborate just a little bit because there's some confusion in people's minds between Intention and motivation. Intention and motivation are two different concepts. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of each. The Mishnah, when it talks about this subject, considers a case like this, a couple of cases. Uh, let's say I need a new pair of tefillin. So I go to the store about, let's say, 8.30 in the morning, and I say, have you got tefillin? Sure. Uh, let me see your selection. I look at them. I say, well, this one's very nice. Let me try it on. Is it okay if I try it on? Sure. So I try it on. Yeah, it fits and it, and it looks and it feels good, so forth and so on. I take them off and I say, sold. Tell me how much it is and I'll buy them. Now, suppose I think to myself, hey, now, wait a second. It's now 9 o'clock in the morning. I put on this villain. I had them on for 10 minutes. I did the mitzvah of tulin. The mitzvah of tulin is to put them on and I put them on. Well, the, the, the result of a, a legal discussion is that I didn't do the mitzvah because I had no intention that when I put them on, that, that putting them on was supposed to fulfill the mitzvah. I was just trying them on for size and comfort. So it doesn't fulfill the mitzvah. I have to intend that I want the mitzvah to be, to be fulfilled. Same thing's true with, um, I'm, I'm practicing my Hebrew reading. So Hebrew is a new language to me, and I'm Practicing. It's seven o'clock in the morning, and I open the Chumash at random, and I start to read Shema Yisrael. I'm reading the Shema. I read the whole paragraph. Whoa, that was good. I don't think I mispronounced a single word. And I look at my watch and say, Hey, seven thirty in the morning. That's the time for Shema. And I just read it. Did I do the mitzvah of reading the Shema? No, I did not because I need to intend that it should count. Now, intending that it should count has nothing 
to do my motivation for doing it. Nothing at all. Maybe I read the Shema in order to impress other people. Or maybe I read the Shema in order to get every word in the world to come. Or maybe I read the Shema because when I do so, my blood pressure goes down. That's motivation. That's what I'm trying to achieve. That's my goal in acting. That's what moves me to act. That motivation means. That's what, which moves you. Intention is what I want this thing to accomplish. And, and, and motivation is what I expect to get out of it. You know, let's say I, I pay my taxes. When my check goes into the IRS, I expect that my check will then be counted off, checked off, Godly paid his taxes this year. That's what I want the check to do. I want it to count for paying my taxes. Why are I paying my taxes? Because I believe in what the United States is doing, because I don't want to go to jail, because I have a new, I'm negotiating for a new job, and there they want to see all your tax receipts. Who knows why I'm doing it? My intention is what I expect the, the action to accomplish, and my, and my motivation is what I expect to get out of it, or what I expect to achieve by it, which, which drives me to do it. So here, if he puts the breads down on the bima and goes out and doesn't know that poor people pick it up, which is the way your words first describe what was going on, then it wouldn't be a special form of the mitzvah of charity. It wouldn't be charity at all. In order for it to be charity, he's got to intend that it be used for charity. If he puts it on and says, I know poor people are going to come in later and they're going to get it, and this way, I don't know who they are. They may know who I am. They may recognize the baking, you know, and the quality of the, of the, of the chalas. Only I make chalas as good as that. But at least I don't know them. And that gives it a very high level of charity. Yes, that's true. That would qualify a very high level of charity. Um, that could be one of the features of what's going on in the, in the story. But I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary. I think there's another feature, which even if he didn't know the poor people picked it up, would make it a precious action. And that's because of three words that you have in the Talmud, the number of occasions. Rahmana liba boy. God desires the heart. A person who sincerely wants to serve his creator, that service is appreciated. Whether it meets the legal conditions of the action or not. Of course, it's much better if it meets the legal conditions. Again, I'm not saying that the Kosh Baruch doesn't pay attention to the action and its status. But a person who tries to do a mitzvah and fails gets a lot of credit for trying to do the mitzvah. Here, the standard example, the Gemara's words are, Mi shechashav la'asos mitzvah v'netnas v'lo asa'ah ma'ala v'kosu ki'ilu asa'ah person who thought to do a mitzvah, their thought to means decided, and was stopped from doing the mitzvah by something beyond his control, gets credit, he's accounted as if he did the mitzvah in certain respects. So here's my example. I'm standing on the street waiting for the red light to turn green, and I look across the street, and I see somebody over there collecting charity, and I say, yes, I'm going to give him charity. Okay, the buses are going by, the trucks are going by, finally the, turn, the light turns green, and I cross the street, and he's gone. He's gone. Did I do the mitzvah of charity? Certainly not. But I get credit, because I wanted to do the mitzvah of charity. And at least in Olam Abba, in the world to come, I will get a reward for that wanting to do the mitzvah, in some sense, equal to having done it. But Rasha says there are consequences in this world that won't accrue, so it's not exactly the same, but there's a great deal of credit for wanting to do the mitzvah. This baker was trying to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, his creator wholeheartedly. He thought he could somehow make up for the missing showbread. Well, it doesn't really make up for the missing showbread, and the, um, the difference would be that if he puts it there, and then the temple is suddenly rebuilt, they'll get another showbread. They <laughs> don't use his chalas, that's for sure. But in the fact that he desires a person's heartfelt service, can appreciate it and say, what do I want from the world? Well, I want heartfelt service together with actions that need to be done. This person provided heartfelt service. That's valuable. It's not nothing because the action wasn't an action. And that's what, what this 
Rav, I don't know if we even know his name. When I heard the story, I didn't get a name. I, would, I guess I shouldn't repeat it if I didn't know the name. Um, he missed that entirely. He discounted the inner, inner reality of the person, and that's what the Arizal said. You can't do that. The, the spirit of Tzvas, we don't go to Tzvas anymore, but the spirit of Tzvas is that everything has hidden dimensions. And you should train yourself to look beneath the surface to see the hidden dimensions. Here the hidden dimension was the soul. I'll give you one emblem of this. When I was living in Baltimore in the 70s, we had a traveler from Eretz Israel who came and stayed at our house for three days. He was collecting support for the people in Eretz Israel. And he told me one thing. He told me that the word Yisrael, if you take the letters of the word Yisrael, you have the first letters of the names of all the patriarchs and matriarchs, all seven of them. Yud is Yitzchak and Yaakov, the Sin is Sora, Resh is Rivka and Rachel, Aleph is Avraham, and the Lamed is Leah. So in the name of the nation, you have the letters for all of the founders of the nation, all seven of them. Gee, that's nice, you know, there they are, presented for you, portrayed for you in the name of the nation. Something, so that's something which I never would have thought of on my own. And it seems when you look at Yisrael, you have to see more deeply that that's, that's what's there. So part of Jewish life is looking beneath the surface. In Svas, that was, uh, I should say, the, the main theme of their, of their efforts. That's why they invested in Kabbalah. Um, and that's the le- lesson for that story. Yeah. How should the rabbi have handled the situation? One thing he certainly could have done was to just keep his presence secret and not disturb them at all. Won't something like that lead to almost like a reform that you're not supposed to be doing? This is not really, you don't put bread in our own, no one does this. If you can let this continue, maybe it'll grow and more people will do it, and then now you have this chain of religion. I mean, you gotta, you gotta say no, you don't do this. Well, first of all, remember, the story was that he came in when no one was there. So when people came in later, all they saw were chalos on the, on, the, on the bima. And then they were given to the poor. So from their point of view, all they see is charity. Let that spread. Let everybody give charity anonymously. That's wonderful. No, there's nothing wrong with that. His meditations were private. He didn't write them out. He didn't record them and play them for other people. So it's not going to spread the practice of his meditation. So again, there's no loss. I, I don't know. I don't know the, the rest of the facts of the story, but if there were a problem of this misinterpretation, then yes, that should be that should be handled. I agree with you. And if not, then, then it's, then it's a, a, of no account. I mean, what really should have done, if he's going to talk to him at all, was say, God loves you. He loves you because of what you're doing. He loves the fact that you feel the loss of the temple. You feel the loss of the showbread. And to make a gesture of charity to make up for the loss of the showbread, to contribute something to the world in the name of the loss of the showbread is fine. That's fine. Just you have to know that there are differences, in in fact, between your bread and the showbread, and therefore not really a substitute showbread, but you're doing something that the Kodesh Baruch Hu wants and appreciates, and you are adding merit to the world which could offset the loss of merit for the showbread, all that's true. So he could have been able to reinforce him and congratulate him and then correct the factual mistakes that he was making. That would have been another way to handle it. Okay. Second story is this. al Shikakodosh lived at the same time as the, uh, as the, as the uh, Rizal. Um, he lived in Svas. And they used to say that on Shabbos, he was a head taller than he was the rest of the week. Apparently, Shabbos sort of straightened him out. And, uh, and he, had a, uh, he had a regular shear, a circle of followers. And one day he was giving a shear on the subject of trusting God. And that day it happened that some other 
resident at Tzvaz, some kind of craftsman, happened to come in to sit in and listen to the shir. Now, the shir were open, you know, anybody could come in. Well, sometimes, and the, the Rizal was selective who he allowed in and who he didn't allow in. But generally, the shir were open, and this uh, fellow, this craftsman, sat down. And the Arizal said, I'm sorry, the, 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 um, the al uh, said, uh, you know, if you really trust in God, even that he'll give you a bag full of gold, if you really trust in God, he'll give it to you. Really? Wow. So after the shir was over, those who were listening got together and they said, look, that's what the Rebbe said. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's take it seriously and do it. And they all resolved to do it. And the craftsmen, hearing this, also resolved to do it. Well, they resolved to do it for 30 days. That was going to be the test. So uh, the 30 days go by. And the dawn of the 30th day comes. And the, the regular students of the al -Sheikh waiting expectantly, you know, two hours to go. And then he goes by, nothing, nothing at all. But my riv, the evening service, craftsman comes in, jubilant, jubilant. A bag full of gold arrived at my house. My house. What had happened was there, was, there were robbers. They're passing through the area and they had the bag full of gold on the back of a donkey. In the middle of the night, the donkey chewed through its tether and wandered off and ended up in his house. Wow. So here are all these full-time students of the al -Sheikh, the holy al -Sheikh, and these people dedicated to serving and holiness and everything else. Zero. Not a nickel. And here's this simple craftsman. Okay, he was there at the shear, and he also resolved, but... Why should he be the only one to get the bag of gold and they not? Can you think of any, any possible explanations as to why that would happen? Why could it happen that those, whoever, I mean, however many there were, 20 or 25 or 30, whatever it was, got nothing and he got it? How they decided on 30 days? I don't know. I don't know. This is the story, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting point. After all, if someone who comes regularly, someone who has a connection with the al Sheikh, feels that he's his Rebbe, so it's not as special as someone who sits in once and he hears this famous rabbi say it and he takes it to heart and does it. That could be a reason why he should get. But it doesn't yet explain why the other shouldn't get. Would that be the only the only realizing factor, the only factor that would determine whether, whether you get or you don't get? I don't know. I think if you can, I'm guessing we'd only just see, if you can think of relative factors, the relevant factors. The, um, the story says they complained to the Asher. What happened? We, your devoted students, didn't get, and this simple outsider did get. So he said to them, what were you thinking about for the 30 days? Well, they said, let's see, a bag full of gold. And I, you know, how could that happen? What, what, what agency could it grow? Are we thinking that God's going to create out of nothing a bag of gold? And if not, so, so how could such a thing happen? And we were speculating, you know, maybe the laws will change or maybe the king will be kind or... It's hard for us to figure out how such a thing could happen. Okay, then he called in the craftsman. He said, what were you thinking about for the 30 days when you were trusting? And he said, I was thinking I'm trusting in God and hope I give it to me. How it's going to happen? What way? What agency? Never occurred to me to think about it. I simply trusted 
So he said, look at the trust that he had and look at the trust that you had. They're not equal. Hearing that God's going to give it, he let go of his own control. He let go of his own understanding. He simply allowed it to happen. Now, I'll tell you something that I believe about this, this uh, situation. I'm just telling you that because I don't have any source for it, but I think it's correct. In a certain sense, this is a lesson of a famous failure of Moses. The famous failure of Moses. The people asked for me. And God says to Moses, tell them they're going to be me. It's going to be me. And Moses says, how am I going to give them me? There's so many of them. If all of their uh, animals will be, will be slaughtered, if all the fish in the sea would be gathered, it wouldn't be enough for them. How can I possibly tell that it's going to be me? It's going to be me. And God says to him, Hayadashev Tikitzar, is God's hand short? God's hand can't do it? You're doubting that I can do it? You'll see that it will happen to you as I told you. Happened using the word mikra. What was the result? The quail. The quail were blown in from the sea and they formed uh, a gigantic pile on the, uh, to the uh, surrounding the camp to the extent that everyone in the camp went out to gather quail and were gathering quail for 36 straight hours. They didn't sleep. So the Ramban asks, well, what exactly is going on here? Hashem said there will be, and Moses said they won't, they can't understand how there could be. And by the way, the oral tradition tells us that this failure of Moses is worse than it's hitting the rock when he was told to speak to the rock, which we read about a few weeks ago. The reason he was punished for hitting the rock by not going to the land of Israel is because that was public. It was public, everybody saw it, and they drew the wrong conclusion about God's relationship to them. So if he weren't punished for it, that wrong interpretation that he presented to them would become, it would become valid. No one's going to give you more valid information about the Creator than Moses. So it had to be reacted to in a very strong way. Here it was a private conversation between a, a, a Moses and a Kodesh Baruch Hu, And he said something which was inappropriate. But the, 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 the an essential mistake, say Chazal, was worse. So the Mamban says that the words that a Kodesh Baruch Hu used give us an insight into what Moses' mistake was. It says, Yikrecha dvari imlo. Shall my word occur to you or not? What's yikra? Yikra means something that looks accidental. You don't see any divine agency in it. <clears throat> Meaning Moses was understanding that a Kodesh Baruch Hu was going to provide it naturalistically. Moses wasn't questioning whether God can do spectacular miracles. He created the universe right. And he, a, a, a being that can create the universe isn't, doesn't have difficulty in creating meat. But he understood that the Kodesh Baruch Hu was going to do it in a naturalistic way. And that he couldn't understand. Kodesh Baruch Hu said, you'll see. Semi-naturalistically, quail is quail. They already exist. The wind is the wind. And the wind blew in the quail. Doesn't Moses sound like the students of the Alshech? But how's it going to happen? How could it happen? To the extent that he projected doubt that it would happen. And he was told that was a terrible mistake. What should he have done? He should have said, because Baruch Hu said it will happen, so it will happen. Now there's a deep, a deep insight into Moses here, maybe which I'll tell you in a few minutes. But this is the same, the same idea. When the Torah tells you that something's going to happen, there's no reason that you shouldn't speculate as to how it will happen. There's no reason, nothing wrong with speculating. But to speculate with doubt and speculate with feeling that that's not a reasonable way, so, you know, what, so what way is it? Uh, and to take the speculation seriously rather than just idle play, which itself is a funny thing to engage in if you're a full-time student of the al uh, it, it, it is a mistake. And that's what the, the, the craftsman didn't do. 
practicing his craft, he's selling his stuff, and because of that un, unexamined trust, so to speak, um, he, uh, he, he merited what he merited. So that's an example of what it means to trust when, when, you, have, when you have a guarantee that of course Baruch is going to do, do it for you. Are we together so far? So now, when we're told that we're supposed to trust the Kodesh Baruch Hu, I think one lesson from the story is these weren't trivial people, the students of the al -Shif. So if they made this mistake, for us it wouldn't be a terrible mistake. You know, they were on a very high level, and they were held accountable for it, but it's something to work to overcome. It's something to, to strive to overcome. That's uh, you know, a question of, of spiritual self-examination and progress. The point about Moses, my, my first Rebbeson uh, told me this, which I think was a, a brilliant, uh, a brilliant uh, insight. One of the characteristics that we hold up as a great pride of the Jewish people, a great success of the Jewish people, is Nasev Anishma. The Torah, was, the Revelation Sinai was on the 6th of Sivan. On the 4th of Sivan, two days before, Kodesh Baruch Hu asked the Jewish people through Moses, do you want my Torah or not? No mountain hanging over their head, no fire on the mountain, no ground trembling beneath their feet, no sound of the shofar, simply Moses talking to them, saying, I have a Torah, and I'm asking you whether you want it or not. Do you volunteer to receive it? And they said, Nasev Anishma, which we understand is difficult, the words are difficult, as usual, but the basic idea is we agree, we commit ourselves to accept it and do it even before we understand it. We're not going to make our understanding a precondition for deciding to accept it. Meaning we're making our commitment on trust. So, that was great pride of the Jewish people that we committed ourselves to take on God's Torah without understanding, uh, without understanding a great deal of it uh, beforehand. And I think if you look at the sequence of events, the fact is that some information about Torah they already received in Mora, and some of it is very hard to understand. So it isn't just okay, I trust you, God. In particular, I trust you that everything you tell me I will understand. That would be easier. No. You've told me some things and they're hard to understand. Some of them, Shoyu uh, Babylon, according to some, like Toysus, we don't have an explanation until today. So it means I'm going to have to accept it where at least in some cases I'll never understand it. I accept it anyway. That's a much bigger step. Much bigger step. Okay, that's gospel. What I, what I said now is gospel, yeah. Uh, isn't it uh, uh, before they accepted that uh, uh, either he uh, revealed himself or at least they, 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 they seen uh, miracles about nature? 100%. 100%. 100% no question. They know like, who they're dealing with. Exactly. I, I think that's right, and that's, uh, that's a good uh, back, background for what they did. But still, they were able to do it. Um, and... So this is a this is a great uh, you know success of the Jewish people. Now my my first Rebbeinson asked the following question: Where do you see this character trait of Nasev Mishma in the life of Moses? On what occasion <coughs> was he told something, commanded to do something, where he said, "I don't understand this. I could have objections to this, but." You know, you're the creator. I accept it without understanding it. I've looked, I've asked this question of a number of people. There doesn't seem to be any. When something happened, or when God said something to which Moses had objections, he had objections. And he voiced them. There's no Nasev Anishma there. There's no okay, I have objections, but who am I? And my objections don't count, and, you know, I'm going to do it full-heartedly, so, uh, without any reservations. No, when he saw there was an objection, he said, but how can that be? How can you do that? 
Not always were the objections wrong. Sometimes the Kodesh Baruch provoked him to object. But, okay, so it's not as if every objection was a mistake. Some of them are, are famous and are, and are, are tremendous, uh, tremendous contributions. But she asked, where's the other side? At least once. That there should be something where he has objections and he accepts it to demonstrate the characteristic of Masa Vanishma. It's a terrific question. I've asked a number of people. Uh, most people that I ask, I mean, knowledgeable people, tell me they don't know what to say. The Rabbi Taub Zechorim Bracha in Baltimore, with whom I was very close, said that the Talmud Sheva Rebbe made a mark on this, and he said, God doesn't want a yes man. Yes, sir, whatever you say. Okay, that's half a joke, and it's more a registering of the problem than it is really a solution. Why doesn't he want a yes man? <laughs> Why doesn't he want Moses to represent that characteristic of the Jewish people of which we are so proud? I, I think, you know, you can't answer this from your imagination. You need a source that would explain it. I don't know of any source that, would, that explains it. Ask other people if you get a good answer. Uh, come back to me, those who are seeing the, the recorded version. Write to me. I would love to have an answer to this question. But this, this is a, a, a deep characteristic, it's kind of global characteristic of, uh, of Moses, which, uh, which, which, which needs uh, explanation. We have to learn that, that sometimes, well, let me give you the examples. There are two famous objections that were raised by people which were accepted and praised. And there are two famous objections that were raised by people that were rejected and condemned. Or, or objections that weren't made. Abraham, when God tells him that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed, Abraham says to God, you can't do that. Breathtaking words. You can't do that. It's unjust. Because if you're going to kill the righteous together with the wicked, it's unjust. You can't do that. When God said to Abraham, take your son and offer him as a sacrifice, and he's righteous, hello, what about killing this righteous person? Doesn't say anything. Doesn't say anything. Uh, Moses, when God tells Moses that he, God, is going to destroy the Jewish people after the golden calf and after the sin of the spies, Moses says, you can't do that. Or maybe slightly less than that. He says, you mustn't do it. It's wrong to do it. And he gives reasons. And in both cases, God relents. Job suffered terrible pain. And he has chapter upon chapter of, of condemnation of what God is doing and speculation about God's deficiencies. And he's very sharply criticized for that. So how do you know what objections are appropriate and how do you know what objections are inappropriate? So there are two answers to this question, and they're both true. One is you can object on somebody else's behalf, but not on your own behalf. If your objection about something that's going to happen to you, you're not, uh, you're not objective about your own condition. You can't trust your own judgment. So when God says to Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed, that didn't touch Abraham personally. He's not going to suffer from it. Okay, there's chesed and everything else. Okay, I'm leaving that out. He's not going to suffer personally from it. So asking for them is asking on their behalf. When God says to Abraham, sacrifice your son, if he's going to object to that, he's objecting on his own behalf. It's his own son that he doesn't do. The case of the golden calf and the spies, God says to Moses specifically, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to make a new nation out of you. You'll survive. And your family will become another new nation. So then when he asks, when Moses asks, he's asking for them, not for himself. That's why it's acceptable. Job was protesting on his own behalf. He's protesting about his own suffering. That's not acceptable. That's one way to divide the cases and explain why two are good and two are bad. 
There's another way to divide the cases, and that is, does a Kodesh Baruch Hu give any hint that he wants to hear from you? If a Kodesh Baruch Hu says, I'm telling you this to get a reaction, then you give a reaction. If he doesn't tell you that he wants a reaction, then you don't give a reaction. So, God says to Abraham, tomorrow, it's the end of Sodom. I'm going to destroy them. Abraham says to himself, what is God doing? Tomorrow's news today? Advanced Reuters? I mean, why is he telling me this? Obviously, if he's telling me this is the plan, he wants to hear from me. Otherwise, <laughs> what's the purpose of telling me? When God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son, he doesn't have to ask, why is he telling me? Because he wants me to do it. That's why he's telling me. God says to Moses, in one case he says, Heref mimeni ve'ashmideim. Release me, and I'll destroy them. Says the Midrash, release you? You're asking me to release you? Am I holding on to your talus? What do you mean, release you? Apparently, it's up to me. You want my approval. Oh, you want my approval? I have a lot of things to tell you. I have a lot of things to tell you. Because God provoked him to answer. Same with the spies. In the case of Job, nobody asked him. Nobody asked him to raise a philosophical complaint and explain all of the things that are wrong and so forth and so on. And he did it in front of his friends. But uh -huh. It wasn't a private meditation on his part. So that's another way in which you can determine when the, when the objection is appropriate and when the objection isn't appropriate. Um, in the case of Moses, um, what we're being asked is not why he made the objections that he did, but rather why in his whole lifetime there wasn't one case where he had an objection and he didn't voice it on the grounds of Nasa and Ishma. That's... that's that was my wife's question, I, to which I, to this day, I don't have an answer. Now, having said all of that, let me, uh, let me introduce one last, uh, last idea. Um, the Gemara says there are three things that Moses did on his own, and in so doing, the judgment that he made agreed to God's judgment. What were they? Well, Moses is on Sinai. The revelation takes place. He remains there for 40 days and 40 nights. In the 40 days and 40 nights, the people make the golden calf. God gives Moses the tablets which have on them the Ten Pronouncements. And he says, go down. They've done destructively. They made themselves a calf. Moses comes down the mountain carrying the tablets. When he sees the calf, and he sees them dancing and rejoicing, he smashes the tablets. Hello, they're not his tablets. What about... Hilchus Nazikin, you know, we're getting a brisker here. They're not his tablets. What do you mean he broke them? Who told him he could break them? Later on, the Kodesh Baruch says, uh, because they were what was going to cement the relationship with the, with the Kodesh Baruch The fact that they made the golden calf means that the crime was a terrific crime, whatever it was. It wasn't that a worship for most of them. And therefore, by breaking the tablets, that relationship was never cemented since it wasn't cemented, the, the crime that they committed had much less significance than otherwise. But he, he did this on his own. Um, the second one was that he separated from his wife. He decided to separate from his wife. Now, how many children did Moses have? Two. And they were both boys. Hmm, there's a mitzvah of procreation, right? And if you hold like Beisil, as we do, in order to satisfy that mitzvah, you have to have a boy and a girl. And he didn't have a boy and a girl. So what do you mean he separated from his wife? It means he gave up on that mitzvah. Really? Who told him he could give up on that mitzvah? And yet later, a Kodesh Baruch Hu confirms it. And in the confrontation with, Mo with Aaron and, and, and Miriam, says Moses' prophecy is different. 
It requires this. But he did it on his own. He did it on his own. By the way, there's a Gemara that says that he made a Kalvachomer. Tysus on the spot says it wasn't a real Kalvachomer. Because if it was a real Kalvachomer, then it would be biblical. It's like a Kalvachomer. It's sort of similar in reasoning, but it isn't a real Kalvachomer. Don't be mixed up by that. The third thing that he did was this. When, Moses, when God told Moses to prepare the people for the revelation at Sinai, he said, tell them, prepare yourselves for two days, and in the third day, I will uh, reveal myself at Sinai. He says to them, prepare yourselves for three days. Hmm. Well, you could read that. Yeah, three days. Two days of preparation, and the third day it's going to happen. So it's going to be a three-day process. But one of the Tanoim reads it, God said prepare for two, and it'll happen on the third. And Moses says prepare for three, and it'll happen on the fourth. He added another day on his own. That's really breathtaking, hey? God says two and three, and he says three and four. According to that time, that's what happened. It was the later day. There's a whole long explanation in the Shem Shmuel why what Moses wanted to achieve, what he wanted to accomplish. Moses is celebrated for those three judgments that he made on his own. Well, there's a lesson there. Serving God, following the Torah, doesn't mean just taking orders. There's room for originality, creativity. There are limits and there are rules under which circumstances you do this sort of thing. But it's not just, tell me what to do. Now, however, there are dangers. For example, when the people come to Aaron, when Moses, in their eyes, delays coming down from the mountain and say, make us a statue. Someday I'll go through that in great detail with you, but make us a statue. It comes out to be the golden calf. And he makes it. So the oral tradition preserves Aaron's motivation. Why is he doing this? Doesn't he know this is wrong? Surely he knows it's wrong. So why is he doing it? The oral tradition says, well, first of all, they didn't come to Aaron first. They came to Hur. And they told him to make it, and he said no, and they killed him. And in the text, Hur is mentioned in, in, in incidents up until this time, and after that, he's never mentioned again. So Aaron knew they mean business. They're not just trying to make trouble. They mean business. And now he says to himself the following. I could do what Hur did. I could die as a martyr. What effect will that have on the Jewish people? Well, we know from later history that when the people killed the prophet Zechariah, who was a Kohen, in the temple, that's when God signed the decree on the first temple that's going to be destroyed. So killing someone who's a prophet and a priest is something which, from which there's no way back. So he says, let's see, what are my alternatives? The alternative is make the golden calf, which is a crime, or don't make the golden calf, and they'll kill me and there's no way back. No, I can't do that. I'll make it, even if it's wrong to make it. I'll make it and I'll suffer the consequences so that is to make their sin a lesser sin. That was his calculation. Okay, now having said all of that, you need to know that his calculation was wrong. It was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. He should have refused. How do I know? Because in Sefer Dvarim it says, Hashem Lahashmido, God said to destroy him for this. The decision was a mistake. God said, you're, guilty, you're worthy of death for this. Moses prayed for him, and the death was, was um, pushed aside, and he became the coin god. It's a, long, it's a long story. But here's the case where Aaron made a decision on his own, and he made a, a, a breathtakingly wrong decision. In a certain sense, Adam did the same thing. He made a decision on his own, and it was breathtakingly wrong. So you have to know that although this can be done, and sometimes it can be successful, it also can be wrong, and it can be deadly, deadly, uh, a deadly mistake and crime. And I think that this is what's going on in the story of Nodav and Avihu. Nodav and Avihu, in the, in the inauguration of the tabernacle, 
on the first of, Nis of Nisan, end of the first year that they were in the wilderness. There were sacrifices, and fire came from heaven to devour the sacrifices. Nodim and Avihu were Aaron's two oldest sons. And therefore, they were functioning as priests. And they brought incense in a certain way that they were not commanded to do. And fire came from heaven and killed them. They died on the day of the inauguration of the tabernacle. Imagine what that was for Aaron. So they had a thought. They had a plan. They also had a, an idea that they were trying to accomplish. And the commentaries talk about it. And it was completely wrong. And that's why they died. Well, the Gemara asks, if you're careful now, why did they die? Meaning, not why was what they did wrong. I mean, I'm sorry. Not what did they do wrong? What they did wrong was they brought incense that they weren't commanded to bring. But what about the bringing of the incense justified the death penalty? That's what the Gemara's question is. There must be features of it because nowhere does it say that if you bring the wrong incense, you have to die. So what about it? Now, the Gemara has, I think, five or more different explanations. Rashi brings two and only two. One is that they had an idea of some, you know, some initiation in the service and didn't check it out with Moses. Could be that it would be right. But Moses is right there. So why didn't you ask him? Why did you trust your own judgment? And the other is that they had drunk wine. They drunk wine beforehand and their judgment was clouded. Rashi brings those two, and only those two. The question is, why, why didn't Rashi bring the other ones from the Gemara? Well, Rashi adds one more piece from the Talmudic literature. <clears throat> when Moses cons consoles Aaron for the death of his sons, and Moses says to him, I knew something like this was going to happen. I have a verse that told me that in some way God's name is going to be sanctified through the strictness that he shows to those who are close to him. And I thought it would be either you or me. And now I see that at least for this purpose, they were greater than we were, than we are. That's why they were chosen to demonstrate this. So the question is, hmm. None of the Avihu brought uh, incense that they weren't commanded. I thought, said Moses, it would be you or me. Why did he think that? Why did he dream that it would have been one of the two of them? I think the answer is because both Moses and Aaron did things on their own. <coughs> Moses did three things on his own, it was his own idea, and he did it. He was praised for it. Aaron did something on his own, his own idea, and it was wrong, but they do things on their own. The, the, the demonstration with Nodav and Abihu was they did it on their own, and they got punished for it, and that shows you something about that. Since I know that you and I do that sort of thing, I thought we were going to do it. No, nope, they were chosen to do it. Now, why the two explanations from Rashi? Because when you inaugurate something, there are two conditions that have to be met. Number one, you have to have the right authority to do it. You have to be the right person to do it. Not every Tom, Dick, and Harry gets the authority to make up new, new theories and put them into practice. You cannot sell on the open market your own medicines. The FDA will come in and shut you down. You have to meet their standards. So that's the first explanation. Moses is there. You thought up this new way of, of, of performing the, the service. Ask Moses. You don't have no right to make that decision. And the other is, you better be right. You better be right, even if you have the authority. In the case of Adam, which I didn't tell you yet, Adam also in the Garden of Eden had a calculation why he ate from the tree, had a whole explanation, a whole rationalization, so forth and so on. And Rav Desta has a whole essay on this. Maybe I'll talk to you next week. <clears throat> and he made a calculation, and it was wrong. And he paid for it. So in their case, if they had drunk wine, and they're making this crucial 
how shall I say, um, what's the right word here? Um, a kind of extravagant innovation, you better be sure you're right. And if your mind is clouded, then you're not taking the appropriate precautions to make sure that you're right. A decision like this has to be made with a fully clear mind. And she shouldn't have done it in the case of things. So I think that the two explanations Rashi brings are the two that explain the severity of making the decision that they made, which the Talmud is telling us why, why they were punished by death. Not to say the other explanations aren't correct either, but Rashi always brings the ones that are closest to uh, how he sees the pshat in the text. And the other ones are part of the oral tradition, and also true, obviously. At any rate, this is, this is just some of the background for initiative and imagination and creativity, all of which are appropriate within certain bounds when, uh, when performed by the appropriate authorities and in a state of mind and a state of, 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 of understanding that is, in fact, correct. Questions? I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of such a source. The words don't sound like it. It says he threw them down. He threw them down. It didn't say they fell out of his hands. So it sounded like it was a premeditated act that he... Was he celebrated for that? I'm sorry? He celebrated Absolutely. He says, the Pasuk says, Barta, the, the tablets that you broke, and the Talmud explains the word asher as yeshakoyach sheshibarta. Giving you a shakoyach that you that you that you broke them, yeah. Um, in the case of uh, uh, Aaron made calculations um, uh, that he thought, okay, if uh, if I tell tell him no, then they're gonna kill me. Uh, therefore, maybe I, I tell him I'll, I'll prove that although it's uh, it's uh, it's forbidden. So doesn't it contradict with the uh, previous idea that um, we need to uh, obey uh, what God says, like from the Al Sheikh example? That you don't need to think about the, you don't need to make the calculation, the all the uh, how it's um, will turn out in in, uh, in in reality. We just need to obey and, and know that like it will, the, the end result will happen. This is calcula calculation, calculation, the Gezer Shava. Right over there, we're talking about specifically where God promises you something, promises you something. I said when promises you something, then you don't have to make calculations, right? That's, that's what you have over there. And the same thing's true when God says to Moses, I tell you they'll have meat. They will have meat. He's promising him something. Then you shouldn't make calculations. We're talking now about mitzvos, talking about commandments. That's not promising you something. That's not obviously the same. Here's where a binyan I won't work. <laughs> yeah, OK? Listen, have a wonderful Shabbos. And see you, Mr. Shem, on Sunday. Thank you.